Hey everybody and welcome back to this new style of video that we're calling The Breakdown. My name is Kyle and I'm the video director here. And uh, the reason that we're doing this new type of video is to dive into the message content that we had gone through over the past weekend and give a little more time to go in depth about some of the things that we talked about or maybe hit on a couple things that we didn't quite have time for. And we just really hope that wherever it is that you're listening or watching this from, that you'll really engage with this and that this will give you some encouragement and help you along in your faith journey. So um, I'm here with Eric How's for going? another episode here. It's yeah, going yeah. pretty good. So I uh, poured myself some coffee here before we started, and I realized these were like kind of Christmassy looking cups. But yeah, I was... felt a little sad because I'm not ready for the snow yet. But the no. kid's in like a t-shirt no. there. Oh yeah. So it's like so maybe it's sorry, well no, it's a Save Our Planet cup, okay. and the child's hugging a, a tree. Oh. So I, I think you can say that it's more of a summery uh, tree hugger. Cup, okay. Which is good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a relief. Oh, well, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent nice. intro. Yeah, super well done. <laughs> yeah. So um, why don't I just uh, kick us off here okay. with uh, the first question. Um, so it's hard to talk about forgiveness without first being on the same page about sin. Do you think we as humans see sin and forgiveness differently than God does? And what are some misconceptions? Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally we see sin differently than God does. I think we see um, quite often we look at sin through through a lens of like things we're not allowed to do. You know, it's 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 this restrictive thing that keeps us from having fun. That's what sin is. Sin's a good time, and and God's trying to get us to be good people. And I don't know that that's, that's right. I think what sin is, is a willful um, breach in relationship between God and us. But, but what happens with sin is, and we've said it at the Foundry Church before, sin is not what you do, it's who you are. We are sinful by nature. So the, the fact of the matter is there's, there's millions of ways we fail God and we don't live up to his standard. He said in Exodus multiple times, be holy for I am holy. Well, holiness is not something we can just kind of acquire on our own. We can't earn that. So there was this this kind of divide that was there, and sin is what created the divide. It's a willful separation by our actions between us and God. So in that separation, what we have to understand is sin is the issue that separates us from God. Nothing else does. Sin is the issue. So it's... Um, it's really important because to live in sin is to live separate from God and to be separate from God ultimately in eternity is hell itself. So we understand that sin is um, part of who we are. So part of something deep within us that we can't control had to be reconciled to God. That sin that's part of our nature had to be dealt with and, um, and I would say God understands that because the life, death, and resurrection of Christ shows us that um, sin is something God takes very seriously. Sin is something we actually kind of joke about, you know? Like you'll eat something and it's like, oh, that's so good, it was, it was sinful. Like, you know, um, like I've heard people joke, like, you know, after like eating something or, or doing something, oh, I feel like I, I need to go to confession, that was so good. And, and there's just this lightheartedness about it, and I think that's one of the great tricks of the enemy, of Satan, is to make us feel lighthearted about the thing that is most important. Treat cavalier the thing that is most vitally, vitally dealt with. Yeah. So I think God has a, a very high view of sin in the sense that he knows the cost of it. I think we, on the other hand, um, we like to make light of it, and even when we're Christians and we like to justify it, sin is not what we do. It's who we are. God's fundamentally working to change our nature in Christ uh, through sanctification, the filling of the Spirit. God is changing our nature, and that is the, uh, the hope we have is that God has dealt with sin, and we are submitting our lives to him that he can deal with it on his terms and in the view that he has of it not just in the view we have we think there's little white lies 
God doesn't feel that way. Great or small, sin is sin, right? That that's the important construct in this is the seriousness with which God takes sin, we should probably adopt his view. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um it's it's hard for us to to think about that sometimes because the way that and I know we kind of like discussed like morality a little bit in our last yeah. episode, which is um on YouTube here on any podcast form they listen to. I don't think I brought that up in the beginning. Um but, you know, we, we think that we, as people, when you define a good person, um, we have such a low standard of morality compared to how God, God does. For um, sure. Because God is holy, righteous, and holy, just. Yeah. Um, and that's why sin has to be punished. I mean, right. if you think of God as like a righteous judge. Right. I mean, if, um, you know, if somebody's a thief or something and they got, get caught, I mean, if the judge lets them go then without any sort of like payment or anything like that, um, that wouldn't make them holy, holy just or anything like that. Am I, am I making sense? Yeah, or, yeah. no, I, I understand what you're saying. Like somebody had to pay the, the price. Right. Sin had to be, there, there's a consequence to it, and uh, it had to be, sin had to be understood and uh, kind of contextualized, which is what the law of God did. It gave a set of rules by which to live by. People couldn't live into it, and then Jesus Christ fulfilled the divine law, right? So he lived into it, he lived the perfect life, and then he died our death. So in the law, we can see a quantifying of sin. In Christ, we can see that he lived to that standard. Then his willful, willing death on the cross for us allows us to understand the true penalty of sin. We, if you want to know how God views sin, look at the cross, yep. right? Yep. Look at what it costs to deal with. And, um, and I think that's an important kind of angle to take on it so that we don't justify what God died to redeem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Um, so why don't we talk about like what sin is and why we need forgiveness? Well, we said it in the beginning, it's our nature, right? So I don't know what your sin issues are. I know what mine are. Um, I know what other people's are. And it's so much easier. And I want to say this. I want you to hear me. It's so much easier to point the finger at other people's sin, you know? And and I feel like in the church we have super sins. And I want to say it again and again and again. There is no super sin. There's just sin. From the smallest to the greatest sin, it separates us from God. And that chasm cannot be bridged apart from Christ. So sin is sin. We in the church um, like to supersize sin and kind of focus in on things so that maybe we feel better. Not always, but there are some things that go on when you say like, what is sin? It's who we are. And if we are going to arrogantly... um, Say like, you know, I know, I know this is a sin, but it's who I am. Right, that's your nature, but God's working to redeem that nature and reform you into the image of Christ, not let you demand that Christ be remade into your image. Absolutely. So we don't supersize sin. We look at like, you know, like you look at like sexual sin. Um, you can say like, well, you know, I just struggle with that. True, there's a lot of people who really struggle with sexual dysfunction. But the reality of it is, is just because you struggle with it doesn't mean it's okay to live into. It doesn't mean it's okay. Jesus died to transform that part of you. Will you submit yourself to the transformative work of God to be remade? And that goes across the spectrum from heterosexual sin to homosexual sin, any sort of... um, of warping of God's intended purpose for human sexuality is sinful. And so when we look at it, we understand that when it gets outside of its boundaries, it's like a river. It causes a lot of damage when it gets outside the channels of the river that it normally flows in when it floods over. That's very damaging. In the same way, our sexual ethic can be that way too. And we need to keep it... um, according to how God said it. And there is a fittedness in our physical being that says there's a certain way this is supposed to work. But we don't supersize 
sexual sins and say, well, it's only the homosexuals who are bad. No, I got a real problem with uh, the guys in our church who are heterosexual and they abuse uh, pornography and different things and act like, well, you know, at least I'm not that. No, same boat, same boat. Just a different dysfunction yeah. of it. Well, and I think that we, we point fingers too when we feel guilty about something. So if like there's a certain sin in my life that I know that I have right. and I feel guilty about that, but I know somebody else who has like a similar struggle or maybe they struggle with it more than I do or something yeah. like that, then I, as a sinful, the sinful nature in me that speaks to my pride because I think, well, I'm not as bad as this person is. And right. I know you kind of talked about that a little bit yeah. in your message. Um, and yeah, that's just, I think that's something that everybody struggles with and it's important to identify that and recognize like I... Because self-awareness is important, and I yeah. think that's one of those things where, because I try to look into myself when I'm feeling reactionary about something and being like, okay, why do I feel this way right now? And mm -hmm. is this like my pride or envy or whatever yeah. it is? And being like, okay, and how can I submit that to Christ? Right. So... Right, and I do think it's so much easier to point out someone else's super sin because it's any any super sin is one that you don't commit, right? Yeah. One that you don't struggle yeah. with. Well, that's true. So if I don't struggle with that, but you do, I can point that out and say that is really, really messed up. You're really jacked up and shouldn't be like that. And in a way, it's just us saying when Jesus died, he didn't have to go as far down to get to me. You're, you're below where I was. And sin is sin. The death of Jesus. And that's self-righteousness too, right? It's self-righteousness. It's yeah. pride. It's, it's a desire not to reconcile in full what's going on inside of you. You think it's a small behavior. And what I would say is scripture points to the fact that it's an intrinsic statement of our nature, not our behavior. Jesus would say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we have to realize something's going on in here that when it comes out, something's broken something's, there's a dysfunction within us spiritually that doesn't allow us to lay bare everything before God in our own psyche because we're like, well, then I'm the same as everybody else. And that's the thing. It's not a competitive moment. It's an opportunity for us as the church to say, look, uh, great people, I mean, here's the deal. Mother Teresa was just as far from Jesus Christ as Adolf Hitler. That sounds so wrong to say, except they both had sinful natures. One submitted their life to Christ and was remade into the image of Christ, and that's why it seems so bad to say that about her. But apart from Christ, she's no different than what Adolf Hitler did. No different, or Adolf Hitler was, right? It's not that, it's the only difference is Christ present in her life, redeeming her sinful nature and her willingness to be laid bare before God. And I would say um, pride, uh, envy, whatever it may be, makes us want to compete against one another to not be the worst of the worst. But as Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. When there's sinners, there's me who's worse than them. What he's saying is, I know my nature. And if we're honest, I think we all know our nature. We just don't like our nature. So we would rather justify our sin and find ways to live into it without feeling guilty rather than deal with it out in the open before God and say, okay, is there any wicked way that lives inside of me that you need to deal with? Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to like yeah. recollect my thoughts for a second here because <laughs> I, I wanted to bring something up um, that definitely ties into this. So let's see. So I watched the film uh, American Gospel, Christ Alone, again for like okay. the third time last night. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I really like the movie. I'd say okay. it's one of my favorites. Um, and there's this point in the movie where, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's, there's, there's tons of different people who are interviewed and they're all kind of like speaking about the same thing. The, um, and I, we won't go down the trail of like the prosperity gospel mm -hmm. or whatnot because that's essentially what the movie is about is like, here is what the true oh, yeah. biblical gospel is. Here's how it's been polluted by like the word of faith movement or um all the other names that they have yeah. for it. And there's this one point in the movie that I remembered from the first time that I watched it was one of these guys on here said, you know, a really common question or rebuttal that Christians get is, why does a good God let bad things happen to good people? 
And he started out with his response to that as like, well, if you think about it, he's only let that happen once. And that was to Jesus Christ on the cross, who was fully man but fully God. Mm-hmm. And um, oh, this, is, this is the part where I'm trying to recollect my thoughts. So actually, let me just ask this. Do you think that the wrath of God has been poured out on only one good person? That person being Jesus. Right. So I've got to go back to Amagio Day, the image of God. Um, if there's anything good in us, it comes from the fact that God put his image into every human being in some way. So there is something intrinsically good within us. Are we good people overall? No, we're sinful by nature. But there is that one part of us that is um, all the goodness of God that was put into us um, I would say this, I struggle with that statement because it sounds really good at an academic level, at a, at a theological level, and it throws back in the face um, the experiences, the faithful perseverance, and the lives of people who have truly been, they've experienced in some measure what they would say was maybe the wrath of God or just the circumstances of this life where life was hard. They were a Job in essence. And I would say, I don't think it's fair to make that big of a statement and diminish the, um, the faithful obedience and trust in God through the darkest of circumstances that many Christians have walked through to say only one person ever experienced the wrath of God. I think the wrath of God is being given over to um, make sure I, I fully believe this, the wrath of God is being separated from God, right? And, and having that moment of separation, which Jesus had on the cross with Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I know many good people have gone through a dark night of the soul where that's been their cry, God, where are you? Why do you feel so far away? My soul is in anguish. I mean, that is Psalms language, right? That comes out of the Psalms a lot. We hear that kind of thing. Um, Are people inherently good? I don't know whether they're inherently good or not. I know this, they were worth saving. So that kind of statement rubs me the wrong way because um, it makes it, again, us and them. Only one good person. So if someone dies apart from Christ and they weren't a good person, then, you know, well, they just weren't a good person. But if a good person dies apart from Christ, it's worth grieving. And I go, wait a minute. Every person, if John 3.16 is true, Every person is loved by God and he desires to reconnect and be in relationship with him through Jesus Christ, which means there is something loving, lovable, redeemable, loved, and um, wonderful about them. Whether we see it or not doesn't matter. God sees it and he wants to redeem everyone. So I would say that type of blanket statements makes us as Christians have this like, well, only one good person ever suffered the wrath of God. I would just look at that and say, I don't know that that's true. I do know that the suffering of Christ was greater than anybody else would ever be able to comprehend because he had known the fellowship of the triune Godhead in glory, in heaven, in creation, and he had given up his place in heaven to be a child, born to a virgin, live this life, die our death, and be separated from God. I think that's more horrible because he knows what communion with God really is. Part of what blunts our instinct on sin is we don't know what we're missing. If we could see in full, or maybe just in part, what we're missing when we dive into sin and are separated from God, I think it would change the way we view sin. Because a lot of times we think the opposite, don't we? We think think if I don't sin, then what am I going to miss? Yeah, we're going to miss out. And I think that's the great deception of the enemy is we as Christians should be asking the question, what am I going to miss? What am I going to miss? What opportunity, what lifelong purpose moment am I going to miss? And why would the devil tempt me now? Why would that temptation come now? Maybe I should just be on my guard and not so indulgent because he's clearly trying to distract me. 
And that's where I think, I think the, that Satan is, um, is crafty in his way of misdirecting our attention at just the right time. And we miss those purposeful moments. So in, in my mind, I, I've got to come back at that question and, or that statement and say, I do disagree with it. Just on a fundamental level of God thought us worth loving and dying for, and God thought there was something in us that was good enough to go through that. Um, are we inherently good? No, no, but he does love us, which means there's something really special there. And I, I don't wanna just discount that special thing because it sounds good to just say off the cuff. That's true. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but I think it's right. good. Huh. Yeah. Well, I think un- uncomfortable questions are important to talk about. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, why don't we move on to another one here? All right, man. So um, that would be, why is forgiveness hard for us to receive? And I think we mean this in like a, in a person-to-person sense too. Yeah. I mean, that's the hardest time, isn't it? It's hard for us to give. I don't know about you, but um, I know for me in my relationships, when someone says they're sorry, it is a personal discipline of mine for me to say, I forgive you. Because I want people to forgive me when I've done wrong and I do enough wrong that I need forgiveness, I would say somewhat often. And um, it's in my marriage, it's in my relationship with my kids, it's in my relationship with people in this church. When I say I'm sorry, I'm hoping people will reply, I forgive you. I don't want them to, to be bitter or, or hardened against God or against me because of something I truly am sorry for. So I'm not gonna be one of those people who's like, I'm sorry if I'm not. If I'm not sorry, I'm not gonna say it. But the reality is when it comes to receiving forgiveness or giving forgiveness, I think it comes down to the basic element of pride. And I see it this way. It's hard for us to extend forgiveness sometimes because we think, who am I to forgive you? I'm not God, right? But, but that's one of those things where it's like, well, no, Jesus called us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Freely forgive as Christ has forgiven you. So there is a discipline in that that realizes, recognizes that in forgiving other people, we are living into our truest and most um, organic nature in Christ. If we are in Christ, the first thing we were was forgiven. And to extend that grace back out is really kind of cool. So it's important. And if we think ourselves too too lowly to forgive, we are saying the gospel or the, the blood of Christ which redeemed us actually doesn't have the final word on that. We're saying actually, um, I know better than you, God. I'm, I'm not good enough to forgive people. I can say it's okay. Or I can say, oh, no worries, it's good. But to forgive somebody is a gift that we as Christians are given because we've experienced it. We know how good it feels. Amen. So I would say there's that, the too low of a view. And then there's also when someone says, you know, I forgive you, and something inside you bristles at that, and you're like, I I don't know if I need you to forgive me. I just need to be good with it and move on. Um, I have that sometimes where it's like, no, I forgive you. And, uh, and I experience this a lot with my own kids because it's a language in our home. And it can be a small thing. I'll be like, hey, sorry about that, bud. And especially my youngest, Ethan, will be like, oh, I forgive you. And it's so funny because sometimes I'm like, I don't know if you need to forgive me for that one, you know. But, but that's my pride too. I don't want to need to be forgiven. I want to be made right, and I want to do it on my terms, not God's. And, and I just don't know that that's biblical. I think forgiveness is something we receive and it's, it's the mercy and goodness of God to not throw us into punishment, but it's the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God to not only not put us into punishment, but to call us his children and pull us even closer. And I think to myself, if I can't receive forgiveness, how am I ever going to receive the fullness of God in my life. If I can't receive 
what is the only thing that gets me into the kingdom, which is the forgiveness of God in Christ? How am I ever gonna live in this kingdom receiving from people who I fail? I mean, you, you work for me here at the church. You've had to forgive me, right? I, I, have I ever asked you to forgive me? I, I don't think, I think so, but okay. maybe. And I would I'm sure assume I, said I forgive you, but. <laughs> yeah. but but you know that I make mistakes. I was asking that because it's not like there's a myth out there that I don't mess things up, forget things, or do anything wrong. But it's it's a matter of being like, you know, I'm sorry. I am sorry, and being able to say that and to be forgiven and have it not bristle me, but to fill me. And there are times where being forgiven rubs me the wrong way, like petting a cat backwards. Um, It's just hard because I don't want to need forgiveness. I want to be okay on my own, but the reality is I'm not. And forgiveness in a healthy practice in life, I think it's a really humbling thing and it keeps us in a posture of always being willing to see where maybe we don't have it right. And, And when God convicts us of something, We can respond in faith and humility to receive forgiveness because we grow from glory to glory. And all your sins are forgiven, but there are willful patterns of sin. Maybe you don't know you have in your life. I know I don't know. And God convicts us of that. And what we have to do is reconcile that. When he convicts us of it, we lay it before him and we repent and follow him. And we leave that behind. We receive forgiveness and live differently. When you do that in your everyday ordinary life, I feel like that process between you and God gets easier or at least you know how to handle it because you practice it in daily life. I think that was a really good response to that. And while we're on the topic of forgiveness still, um, why don't I ask the next question here? So why do we sometimes feel more comfortable overcompensating to repair our sin than just receive forgiveness? And is that pride? Hmm. Big question. Well, and I just think in the end, if I can fix it and nobody finds out about it, overcompensation is an effort to maintain control. When you lose it in a car Ooh, and you yeah. overcorrect, you're trying to maintain control, yeah. which is good. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't maintain control yeah. when you're driving. But when it comes to sin, when it comes to um, forgiveness, what we have to do is understand we never had control. We were sinful by birth, at birth, by nature. Our nature was sinful. So we had already lost control. I mean, just go and watch little children play. There is one screaming mine, right? Yep. And kids will, they'll walk up and take something from another kid. And you're like, oh, why'd you do that? I wanted it. Well, give it back to him. No. And you're like, well, what is going on? It's not that they're bad people. Right, We're not saying that, but we're saying there's something wrong with us at a nature level, yep. at the very nature of who we are. What was the original sin? The original sin was when the serpent spoke to Eve about the fruit God said not to eat. And in the end, he said, you will not surely die if you eat of it. So he accuses God of lying. But he says to the, to the woman, he says, God knew that when you ate of the fruit, you would become like him, knowing good from evil. Those are the words out of Genesis 3. And the woman looked at the fruit and seeing that it was good to look at and appetizing, took and ate. I don't think the fruit was so appetizing, but the pride of being like God because they walked with God in the cool of the day. They knew God. They knew his power. They knew his presence. And it was an altogether attractive idea to be like God. It was rooted in pride to exalt oneself against God. That's what Satan had done and he was cast out of heaven. So when we look at this, what I would say is we overcompensate. We do in our own small way reach up and take the fruit that says, I'm gonna handle this sin issue on my terms and I'm gonna be like God. I know good and evil, so I'm gonna do some good things and get this right. When when the reality is our good behavior doesn't save us from the sin and the the nature that lives within us. It's just good works 
I don't mean to be crude about it, but you're basically putting frosting over a cow pie, right? <laughs> Looks like something, but you don't want to bite into that. Yeah. We frost some things in our lives that don't that shouldn't look like a cake. We do good things and we overcompensate in order that we will feel a moral goodness. And in the end, what I believe is God is God has said in Christ, there is no moral goodness in you. There is a part of you that bears my image and I love you and I will give you the fullness of Christ and remake you into his image. And we're like, okay, but what part of that can I work on? You, know, you ask people, you ask most Christians, where, where is, is God working on you? And most Christians will reply, uh, a lot of Christians will reply, you know the thing I'm working on the most have you ever noticed that? People say the thing I'm working I'm, on. We're, yeah, I'm they make it on, about them. And that's generally, I mean, that's never the question I ask. I never say, hey, where are you working really hard to be more Christ-like? Yeah. Not at all. My question always rotates back to what's the thing God's working on in you? And I would say 95% of the time, uh, the answer comes back pretty bluntly. The thing I'm working on, and I'm like, that's not what I ask. That's the overcompensation. It's a desire to maintain control of a nature that rules over us. And the only way to truly gain, gain control, should I go carry Underwood on this with the whole Jesus take the do wheel it. thing? Yeah. I can't. Um, but the, the thing we have to do is step back from the seat of control and autonomy of self and give ourselves, fall headlong at the cross and receive what is freely offered there the forgiveness of our sins and that sinful nature and the opportunity to live, as Eugene Peterson said, a long obedience in the same direction. We begin to live as disciples of Christ, being made into his image, which means we respond to the gracious conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life by repenting of sin and leaving it. We don't stop doing bad things, we follow Christ. Not doing bad things is a byproduct of following Jesus Christ. And I think that gets missed. I'm not being a good person. I'm becoming like Christ. So not doing bad things is a byproduct of living more like Jesus Christ. I don't even have anything to add know, to that. That, that was, was really good. good. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> All right, so this is a little bit of a longer one. Okay. We're still on the topic of... Um, Forgiveness. So I like the example of uh, when you were like on stage walking around with the weights, which yeah. looked kind of painful. Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, you'll see me pop my neck. I like when I took them off, I was like, and my neck was yeah. weird. I'm like, oh, Ooh. I popped my neck. So yeah. Oh, man. It was a little weird. Uh, well, yeah. it was nice that you went through the, yeah. the pain of doing that example yeah, to make a what? point. I dropped one of the weights on my toe. I figured you uh, probably th would at this some point. Toe, oh, oh, my goodness. I dropped it on it in second service. Yeah, you oh, might man. want to notice there was some yelling. Oh, I, I was like, weights? I got really passionate, but you know, like Ethan's five like, and like eight pounds, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were. It was just. It was just the edge of that steel weight just dunk on your toenail, and you're like, <laughs> Oh no! I'm in front of 500 <laughs> people, and I can't speak what's uh, on my heart. So yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you held out though, so that's yeah, good. yeah. We got it together. <laughs> All right. So, um, can we dig into the difference between the things that hinder us, like? You know, shame, trying to earn forgiveness, penance, and the sin that entangles? I think so. I, I think we can. Um, so I would say shame is directly related to your past. I mean, there's just things we're ashamed of, right? I don't know about you. There's things I'm ashamed of. And, and I'll be honest, there's things that I'm glad I live a long way away from where I went to high school. I was a different dude back then. I was not the same guy I am now, and it's not by my own works, it's not by my own righteousness, but I don't wanna go back to that guy, and I don't really wanna be reminded of him, and shame is hard to take off because it is stuff we did. It's not generally stuff, well, that's not true. It's stuff we did, and for some of us, it's things that was done to us, and I would say that shame um, is one of those things directed, directly related to our past actions or things that, where people have acted against us and we feel the weight of that. that. That is shame, it's very heavy and it keeps you from feeling freedom to obey God. I mean, you're just not gonna do it because you know 
you did that in your past and why would you ever speak up? I would say the sin that entangles, so, so shame, trying to earn forgiveness in those things is rooted in this, um, this sense of unredeemable worthlessness, um, not a full trust in the gospel that I can earn my own forgiveness, all these things. There, there is an abandon to the Christian life that when you take the leap into Christ, it is leaving behind all that was and falling only onto him and trusting only him. So there's, there's those things that hinder us, but the sin that easily entangles is the more nuanced internal nature of our being that I talked about earlier where God convicts parts of our nature and he transforms us. And when I say like, you know, Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, is so much a story in my life of God working out slowly and patiently the areas in my life that if he just cut it out, I think it would kill me. But he, with the tenderness of his spirit and the kindness of his love and desire for me to follow him and know him, and enjoy him and be used for him. I think in that, he's willing to do the long, hard, difficult work of disentangling me. So have you ever gone fishing? I have, you it's have. been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> um, if you've ever gone fishing and you get your, uh, you get your reel kind of snarled. Um, the worst. You know, or you, if you've got like your big open water fisher and you get, um, you get like either on an open water pole or one of the trollings, it gets um, back casted, right? Or, or it just kind of, we always call it a bird's nest. You look down and you're like, oh, oh and it's yeah. a bird's nest. And what you have to do is you have to cut the line and disentangle everything, right? Or you sit down and you take the time and you figure out where the, the snag is. You fix this snag, then you get it, and piece by piece you get it unraveled. It takes a lot of time. That's what I say is the sin that easily entangles is the sin that happens, and it's so within us that um, we get a bird's nest, a uh, fishing metaphor here. That bird's nest where back casted is a reel, and we're like, oh, and it just looks terrible. And that's the entanglement of sin. Things that happen in the normal rhythm of life that all of a sudden you look down and you're like, whoa, when did that happen? When did that, when did that happen in my life? So there are certain patterns of sin that we fall into. We have folks who struggle with addiction and there's patterns of sin that go with that. We have other people who struggle with, um, you know, we're in a culture that is victim chic. It's very, it's very chic to be a victim of something. What does that mean? Um, so it, chic would be, it's very... Um, Oh, chic is in like a C H I C, C. Yeah, chic. Okay. So, so it's 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 almost stylish. It's almost in vogue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. like it's like well, you know, I would do this, but you know, this is my thing. I can't do it because of this. And it's just kind of soft spoken. Like this is what's broken in me, and and there is an identity around brokenness right now that I would say easily entangles people because we would rather focus on what's wrong than what God has set right. And when we as Christians live talking only about where we were victim, we're a victim or where we're broken or different things, part of me is like, didn't Christ come to bind up our wounds and bind up the brokenhearted? So I'm not saying we don't have wounds. I'm saying we have a savior greater than those. And when that's all I hear, I think it's a sin that easily entangles. I think it feels good to indulge all of our feelings. But my feelings lie all the time right now. The feeling I have is that I want an in and out double double, even though I'm far away from do, you know in and out. I had but, one for you a few weeks oh, ago. Oh man, they're so delicious. <laughs> but um, but if I lived on that, and and my feelings told me this is good, I can guarantee you, I'm not going to be as healthy as God would want. I'm not saying I shouldn't have one when I go to California. <laughs> I just love them so much. But, um, but the reality is there's a certain diet that keeps us balanced physically. There's a certain diet emotionally that I think Satan in a very crafty way has helped us identify our hurts. Everybody's looking inwards, deeply inwards. 
and, and we're, you know, I'm just doing some reflection on me. I'm like, why don't you do some reflection on him? That's a sin that easily entangles. I'm not against self-awareness. Super have had to learn that. And I, that's actually something I had to learn where some people that comes naturally didn't to me. It didn't to me. And I think I've hurt people and made mistakes by being overly blunt, overly, you know, kind of forceful and lacking some self-awareness. That can be very bad. But um, that is very bad. Uh, but, but at the same time, I think this self-indulgent, like, oh, I'm just, this is really for me right now kind of thing. I don't think that's biblical in the least. I don't think that's, I think that's a sin that easily entangles. It's a self-centeredness that feels good, like that cheeseburger. It feels good. It's delicious, but it's not the best thing for me. Not that I don't love it, but it's not the best thing for me. In the same way, emotionally, there's sin that easily entangles. I think of um, people who don't control their temper and they kind of lose it and they're abusive to people. I mean, there's people that that comes very naturally to. It just comes out of them. And I'll say like, for people who do that, that comes easily as easily to them as it does for an introvert to quietly read a book and just kind of take something in, that behavior comes naturally and it's destructive. It easily entangles and it causes a lot of damage around them. That's a very entangling thing. So when I look at this, I think um, the difference in the weights of it is when you've done those things, you carry the shame of it, but it still comes naturally. Whether it's an internalized sin that entangles, an external sin that entangles, whether it's, you know, whether it's like complete and total like focus on your comfort, your appetite, um, whatever the appetites may be, and your desires, or it's um, an over-obsession about what's wrong with you, um, how you've been wronged, who's messed you up in the past. We can get into that and it feels so good to go into it. And the next thing you know, it's like weeds grown around us and it's only the love of God in my mind that does the work of sanctification in the Holy Spirit coming in and slowly detangling us. The problem is, if you've ever fixed a, a back-casted reel, it takes a long time. Once you get it right, you're like, yes. The worst thing that happens is when you throw your next cast, like off a pier, and, you're like, and you, you don't keep your thumb on the, the spool as it's going, and you feel it go too far over, and there's a, and you're like, oh, no. Oh, and you have the same thing happen again. Yep. That's what I feel like it happens in the Christian life. God gets us straightened out. And it so easily entangles. Mm-hmm. But thank God for his patience yeah. to know how fallen. I mean, what does scripture say? God is aware that we are just dust. He knows our limitations. He knows how finite we are. So the sin and shame that hinders us keeps us from living obediently. Or the, the shame and um, the trying to fix it yourself keeps us from obeying and living purposefully in him. But the sin that easily entangles does the same thing, keeps us from fully living for him by getting entangled in things that take time to unwind. It was also really good. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> so um, why don't we read this little piece of scripture out of All Hebrews right. 12, verse 1, and then we'll go into the last question that we have here. So... It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance in the race marked out for us. So what's the difference between doing good deeds so we can make up for our sinful past or make people think that we're really good Christians and that good deeds we should do out of love and service to Jesus? So how can I tell the difference in myself? That's a good question. Yeah. Did I word that well? Yeah, you okay. did good. Yeah. So you can't make up for your sinful past. If we just would recognize that, there's no making up for it. There is redemption in Jesus. That helps us. So we quit trying to do things. I'm one of these people, like um, one, of the, one of the sacraments in the Catholic Church is penance. We do something in some way to remember, recognize, and pay for our sin. We don't have to do that. 
That was done by Jesus. I'm not saying the Catholics are wrong in, in trying to be aware of the cost of your sin. I think, that's, I think there's something good in that. But what I'm saying is nothing we can do to make up for it. It is um, Oswald Chambers. Uh, it's actually the tagline to my email signature. Uh, Oswald Chambers says it this way. Let the past sleep, but let it sleep in the sweet embrace of Jesus Christ. And let us go into the um, infinite future with him. Something that I can't remember how hmm. last word I want to open my email, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but it does say, you know, like let the past sleep, but let it sleep in him. And then we will go into an indomitable future with him. Well, let's go forward with him in mission. And I think there, there's a tremendous freedom in not having to look back and, um, and try to make up for things. Sometimes you can look back and uh, ask forgiveness from people that you've hurt. You can look back and be remorseful. Um, you can look back and kind of count the cost. Like, wow, that hurt a lot of people. Or, wow, that was just all about me. And you can learn and you can grow. But the reality of it is there's nothing you can do to make up for it. Uh, oh, and I don't think people really believe you're a really good Christian in this world, period. I think people are skeptical um, because we've seen Christians manipulate things for their own benefit. You know, I saw an article the other day about the, the, the Christian leaders in the world who have the highest net worth. And when I saw the one that was like over $150 million, I was like, oh, Lord, that is hard for my soul to take because... It's just, you look at it, I don't think they're bad people. I don't know if they're good or bad people. I just know that um, it seems antithetical to, um, to the taking up of a cross and following Christ in mission. Maybe it's not. Maybe God has just lavishly blessed them to do their ministry. Um, you know, I look at that kind of stuff and I, I find myself going, that's why people don't think a lot of us Christians are good. We're hypocrites, you know? We're, we say nice words on Sunday and then we cut them off as we leave the church parking lot and we get really ticked off that they got out before us um, or we, you know, we're rude to a server out to lunch and people are like, I go to church with that guy. He's such a jerk, right? I don't think people look and go, you know what, they are a really good Christian. I think there's more of a skeptical view nowadays. It's like, I wonder who they really are. Wonder what they're like at home, right? Mm -hmm. So I that's my take on like people's opinion of a really good Christian. Um, and what's the difference between the good deeds we do to cover up a dark side and the good deeds we do out of a life that's being transformed into the image of Jesus? The singular difference is the winsome, wonderful, convicting, transformative presence of the Holy Spirit that will speak an accurate word into a life that maybe you don't know the accuracy with which you're speaking, but by the word of God, there's something happening in and through you that doesn't point to you. It's just not about you. It's, it's this winsome thing that comes out of the heart of God that says, I am for you to the other person. And um, when we live a life serving Jesus Christ, we will do obscure things that we may never know the outcome of, not because God's just testing us, but um, you know, if you're in a parking lot and you get that weird flutter of conviction to walk over to a planter and pick up a cup and you're like, why? And it feels like a spiritual conviction and you're like having an argument with God, like I don't wanna do that, that's so weird, why would I do that? But here's the thing, who are we to question that? There may be a single mom sitting in her car or I don't know, a, a wife in a great marriage with a great family and kids and everything seems to be good but there's something really wrong and she just prayed the prayer. God, if you're real, have somebody walk over and pick up that cup. And God would be like, okay, not because God does pony tricks, but because God wants people to know that he's present and he prompts your heart and you think, why would I pick up a cup? That's not our question. We live in service to God. So when he asks, we do. And we trust that in some way in God's economy, it works out. In God's economy, what we do, those little acts of obedience, we will probably never know the depth to which God used them to glorify Jesus. So the difference between the acts to look like a good Christian 
and actual works of service to Jesus Christ is the winsome spirit of an obedient Christian who trusts the motivations and the heart of the God who died to save them. So I think this is a pretty good point for us to be able to wrap this up. I think we've had a really, really good discussion here again. Talked yeah. about some harder topics, but I think yeah. they're super important to hit. I agree. I agree. But yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Like if it were easy to do, like everybody can win the Lombardi trophy on Madden. You can set it to rookie and just run the table, right? Yeah. Um, for Xbox and PlayStation people, that was for you. PlayStation. Um, nice. Xbox. <laughs> my boys like Xbox. Um, and my wife and daughter think they're dorky. <laughs> so there's that. Um, <laughs> well, but, not uh, right. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> but, um, but anybody can do that, but it takes a different type of drive to grind and do the tough things in order to actually go win the Lombardi trophy. Mm -hmm. Well, and you were saying right. last week about like, uh, you told your son to like do the hard things in life. Do the hard things. Yeah. And I would say this is one of those hard things. May not be comfortable. It may be painful. I have a number of those discussions going right now and it's okay. I'm okay being uncomfortable. I don't want to be there, but the, the reality is uh, because of the grace of God, he puts me in those places to grow me into the image of Christ. So doing those hard things really helps us mature in our faith and do the things that will bear much fruit in this world. There will be a harvest of righteousness if we, if we attend to these things and we don't apologize for the fact that we know what we believe and we believe in the best way of applying it to life. We may be wrong and we will learn and grow, but the reality is we're doing our best with what we know and have experienced in faith, in doctrine, and in life and ministry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and we're really glad that we got some nice comments on here too. Yeah. So yeah. Um, like uh, what Sam said here about like using this as like a devotion or like going along with their devotions like yeah. every week with their family. It's like, that's something we never even thought yeah. about. It's like you're just seeing how God can use this thing to accomplish Absolutely. whatever. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I love that. I love that, you know, if people, like, if you're at work and you're, you're working on a line at a factory, you can just throw this in and listen. I'm like, hey, bless you. That's awesome. I love listening to certain podcasts. When I have some time in my day to do a few things, I like to throw a podcast on and listen, try to learn a little and grow. And I think it's a good place. It's good content. You're not going to hear anything, you know, raunchy or reprobate going on, and it's good. It fills your life with things that are worth wrestling with. And, and in faith, I think it's the most important topic in the world. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. And as always, I think we'll just throw it out there again. Uh, if you have any questions that we might, we can't guarantee that we'll get to in the next video, but you are more than welcome. Put them on Facebook, YouTube, wherever. Um, and we'll definitely check it out. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, again, thank you for the nice comments. And this has been a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, we will see you again in the next one. And Eric, thank you again for taking the time to do this. Kyle, you're so. doing a great job. It's fun. I feel like I'm on the Kyle show. Yeah, the Kyle yeah. show. The Kyle show. <laughs> nice little suit and tie there. Uh, maybe next time I'll suit wear one of those. Suit and t-shirt. Oh, uh, it's the foundry way. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Thank we'll catch you. you next time. You got it.